our next talk is from David Solomon, who is an assistant professor here at UCSF in the Department of Pathology and the director of the Molecular Neuro-Oncology Program. And he has been really instrumental with our group, really pushing things forward with both genomics and epigenomics and how we diagnose brain tumors. So he is going to now speak to us about brain tumor genomics and epigenomics, transforming neuropathology from a microscopic impression to an exact diagnosis. So thank you so much, David, for, for being here today, and you can take it away. Um, okay, yes, thank you very much. Um, I have uh, nothing relevant to disclose, but am, dis am accepting donations to support my research uh, and can be contacted at my email address. Uh, the classification of, of primary CNS neoplasms is expanding, as we just heard from Ari. Uh, and this is due to the fact that there's a wide spectrum of glial, neuronal, and brinal and meningeal tumor types that arise in the central nervous system and are associated with divergent biologic nature, including distinct cells of origin, uh, genetic alterations, and clinical outcomes. Uh, and this talk will highlight some of our recent advances in the molecular pathogenesis and classification of primary CNS tumors. And there are two major molecular technologies that are leading to rapid advances in the way we classify and treat CNS tumors. The first is next generation sequencing, where we're actually looking at the specific nucleotide code, looking for mutations, amplifications, deletions, and other rearrangements. And the other is DNA methylation profiling, where we're actually looking at epigenetic imprinting uh, marks on the DNA molecules. And the pattern of these marks can be very helpful with tumor classification. Uh, and so to go through some examples of what we've been learning and, and how this is affecting our classification, I'm going to start with ganglioglioma, uh, which, as you know, is the most common epilepsy-associated neoplasm, often arises in the temporal lobe of children and young adults and is associated with seizures. And it's typically an, an indolent tumor, uh, WHO grade 1, uh, but these can recur and undergo anaplastic transformation. Uh, here's a histology of a classic ganglioglioma. Uh, these are neoplastic mixtures of both neurons and glial cells. They frequently have eosinophilic granular bodies and perivascular lymphocytic cupping. In our genomic evaluation of gangliogliomas, we've identified that nearly 50% of these tumors have BRAF B600E mutations. However, uh, there is a long tail of other MAP kinase pathway alterations in those tumors lacking BRAF B600E mutation. And these include other BRAF non canonical variants, as well as fusions, as well as alterations in other MAP, MAP kinase pathway genes, including RAF1, KRAS, NF1, and rarely FGFR1 or 2. Uh, and these are typically the solitary pathogenic alterations. These tumors typically lack. Her promoter mutations, IDH mutations, histone H3 mutations, and many other uh, genetic drivers characteristic of other tumor entities. Uh, we identified a novel recurrent insertion in codon R506 in gangliogliomas uh, that we see in, in nearly 10 to 15 percent of these tumors. And ganglioglioglomas with other MAP kinase pathway alterations are actually histologically indistinguishable from those with BRAF B600E mutation. And shown here is an example of a tumor with RAF1 fusion. Uh, RAF1 encodes CRAF instead of BRAF. And we have not been able to identify that the specific MAP kinase pathway and alteration in ganglioglomas is predictive of clinical outcome. Uh, no matter what the, the MAP kinase pathway alteration is, the, the outcomes seem to be uh, similar uh, in our patient cohorts at UCSF. Uh, this is one of the new uh, tumor entities that's being added in the forthcoming uh, 2021 WHO classification under the name myxoid glioneuronal tumor. Uh, this has previously been referred to in the literature as DNET-like neoplasm of the septum pellucidum. Uh, these were the first three index patients uh, at UCSF that we encountered. Uh, as you can see, there are uh, lesions centered in the base of the septum pellucidum or septal nuclei. Uh, these tumors are characterized by oligodendrocyte-like cells in a prominent myxoid stroma. And we identified a recurrent dinucleotide mutation that happens at codon 385 in the PDGFRA oncogene. Uh, th this is the characteristic mutation in this tumor. Uh, it, 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 is in the platelet-derived growth factor receptor alpha protein, uh, and it is changing the lysine residue at, at 385 to either a leucine or isoleucine, and is presumably causing constitutive activation of this receptor tyrosine kinase. Uh, but we've 
identified that myxoid glioneuronal tumor not all not only arises in the septum pellucidum, but can also arise in the corpus callosum, as shown in these two examples, and can also arise in the periventricular white matter centered around the lateral ventricles. And we've also observed that it can be associated with dissemination throughout the ventricular system, both time at both at time of presentation as well as over disease course. Uh, and this has maintained an indolent behavior and is being added as a WHO grade one tumor. Uh, here is another new tumor entity that's being added, multinodular and vacuating neuronal tumor, or MVNT. Uh, these typically involve the deep cortical ribbon and superficial white matter, uh, predominantly in the temporal lobe. Uh, these patients often present with seizures or headaches or can be found incidentally. And these are composed of monomorphous neuronal elements within discrete and coalescent nodules uh, with evacuation in both the tumor cells and their matrix. And so shown is the imaging. You can see the multinodular, multinodularity of this lesion. And this is recapitulated at the level of the histology where you can see these evacuated nodules that, that coalesce. Uh, and on the right is a higher power where you can see the neoplastic neurons and the evacuation both within the neuronal cytoplasm as well as the background stroma. Through genomic evaluation of multinodular multi evacuating neuronal tumor, we have identified that there are recurrent mutations or in-frame deletions in exon two of the MAP2K1 oncogene in virtually all cases. And these are associated with activation of the MAP kinase signaling pathway, as shown here by phospho-ERK immunohistochemistry, a marker of MAP kinase pathway signaling. Uh, this is another tumor entity that we've worked on is cordoid glioma, which is a slow-growing non-invasive glial tumor located in the anterior third ventricle. Uh, these most commonly occur in middle-aged adults with a slight female predominance. And these tumors are histologically characterized by cords and clusters of epithelioid glial cells within a prominent mucoid stroma. They're characteristically GFAP and TTF1 positive by immunohistochemistry. And we've identified that cordoid gliomas have a recurrent D463H mutation in the PRKCA gene in all cases studied to date. Uh, this mutation uh, is located within the kinase domain of PRKCA, uh, which encodes the catalytic subunit of protein kinase C. And this mutation is highly characteristic of cordoid gliomas and has not been found in any other human tumor type to date. And so this is very characteristic of this tumor type. Uh, this D463 amino acid is actually localized within the active site of the kinase domain of PKC alpha and act acts as the proton acceptor during ATP hydrolysis. Uh, we've shown that this specific mutation causes activation of the MAP kinase signaling pathway downstream as associated with high levels of phospho ERK expression in cordoid gliomas comparable to other low-grade glioma types with BRAF mutations or fusions and have shown that this mutation is oncogenic in immortalized human astrocyte uh, models and assays. And a genetic model of cordoid glioma that we've established is sensitive to MEK inhibition. As you can, as shown here, trametinib is a small molecule MEK inhibitor uh, that blocks the growth of immortalized human astrocytes expressing this PRKCA mutation, uh, but not other glioblastoma or malignant glioma cells that lack PRKCA mutation and may represent a therapeutic strategy for this tumor type. Um, Focusing on DNA methylation, uh, our superhuman investigator here at UCSF, Joe Costello, uh, led a study in the year 2000 that was published in Nature Genetics, where they identified uh, patterns of uh, CPG island methylation that, that were shared among each tumor type, and that these patterns display tumor type specificity. And this is what laid the foundation for now using DNA methylation signatures uh, to help classify neoplasms. And so this is the foundational study that was published in Nature by uh, the group at Heidelberg at DKFC. Uh, each, this is a TSME plot of genome-wide DNA methylation profiles. Each dot on this plot represents an individual tumor, and tumors of the same type will cluster together. And so once you have a reference landscape map of the methylation, you can take an individual patient's unknown sample and compare against this map and say, what is the epigenetic signature of my patient tumor's unknown sample most like? And this can help with classification. And this is an example of how this works. This is a six-year-old boy at UCSF who presented with nausea and headaches, had an enhancing mass centered in the fourth ventricle in the posterior fossa. The histologic diagnosis for this case was medulloblastoma. 
Uh, but we want to know medulloblastoma is a variable disease, and we want to know what is this child's prognosis and what intensity of radiation and chemotherapy is required. Using our targeted next generation sequencing panel, the UCSF 500 panel, we were not able to identify any variants to assist with subtyping or prognosis. And it's important to know that many group three and group four medulloblastomas are actually driven by enhancer hijacking the events. And these events can't be reliably assessed by targeted MGS panels. However, we can now use DNA methylation profiling to more accurately classify medulloblastoma. Uh, the black dot that the arrow is pointing at is this child's tumor. And then unfortunately, this, this child's tumor was a group three medulloblastoma. And as shown here on this Kaplan-Meier plot, what does this mean? Um, unfortunately, the group three medulloblastomas are the ones with the, the worst prognosis. And so this child needs the most intensive chemotherapy and radiation to have the best chance for survival in comparison to some of the other subtypes with more favorable prognosis. In order to uh, further study uh, the impact of DNA methylation, I wanna show you a case example and show how this is kind of revolutionizing the way we practice diagnostic neuropathology. Uh, this is a 35 year old male who presented with headaches and right-sided weakness and paresthesia. You can see that there's a large enhancing solid and cystic mass. Uh, for this one, there was a low grade neoplasm with round cell oligodendrocyte like features. Uh, and, and it was challenging to classify based on our histology alone. And the, the initial histologic diagnosis was low grade glial or glial, glioneuronal neoplasm. By next generation sequencing, we identified fusion breakpoints within FGFR1 and TAP1. And in FGFR1, TAP1 gene fusion was a solitary alteration identified by UCSF 500 panel or NGS panel here at UCSF. And what does this mean diagnostically and prognostically for this patient? And so it turns out that the FGFR1 oncogene is actually promiscuous and is altered in many different brain tumor entities, including pilocytic astrocytoma, rosette forming glioneuronal tumor, dysembryoplastic neuroepithelial tumor, and extraventricular neurocytoma. Uh, and so FGFR1 activates both the PI3 kinase and MAP kinase signaling pathways and is actually activated by three distinct oncogenic mechanisms in, in gliomas. Uh, the first is through gene fusions, most often with TAP1 as the partner. You can also have tandem duplications of the kinase domain, or you can have missense mutations at one of two hotspots within the kinase domain, either N546 or K656. And so in order to study how FGFR1 alterations uh, help with classification, we've performed DNA methylation profiling on 30 FGFR1 altered low-grade neuroepithelial tumors of diverse types. And what we found is that these tumors shown in the open triangles actually do not form a single entity, but cluster together with multiple distinct tumor types. And so if you look at those that epigenetically cluster together with RGNT or rosette forming glioneuronal tumor, these ones are all those that have FGFR1 hotspot mutations at N546 or K656. Uh, they never seem to have the tandem duplication of the kinase domain, and they never seem to have FGFR1 fusions, and they frequently have co-occurring PIK3CA or PIK3R1 mutations. This is in contrast to pilocytic astrocytomas or DNETs, as well as extraventricular neurocytomas that seem to lack this co-occurring PIK3CA and PIK3R1 mutations. Uh, pilocytic astrocytomas and DNETs frequently have those hotspot missense mutations or tandem duplication of the kinase domain, whereas extraventricular neurocytoma is highly enriched in, F in tumors with FGFR1 TAC1 fusion. And so actually this patient's tumor that I just showed you was, was by methylation in extraventricular neurocytoma and is one of these ones with FGFR1 TAC1 fusion, uh, as shown at the top right. Uh, importantly to note, though, is that some tumors still remain challenging to classify despite multimodal analysis and may represent rare and yet to be described tumor entities. Uh, shown here as an example in a 47-year-old female, the histology is ambiguous and the DNA methylation profiling uh, is, is still difficult to classify. Uh, and with that, I'd just like to acknowledge the whole UCSF neuropathology, neuro-oncology, and neurosurgery team. Uh, here's our group photo prior to COVID when we could stand next to each other and not be wearing masks, as well as my lab group uh, shown at the bottom right. Uh, many wonderful people that uh, have really enjoyed working with over the last few years here at UCSF. 
uh, and would also like to acknowledge my funding sources, including the NIH including the NIH Director's Early Independence Award, the Glioblastoma Precision Medicine Program here, the Brain Tumor Score, and the Morgan's Adams Foundation. Uh, and thank you very much for your attention and your time. <laughs>